How are you doing? This is David W. Williams, also known as Dom and Dave. And what we're going to talk about today is it's the citizens' fault that police are scared of acorns and tasing handcuffed suspects. Let's get straight to it. You are responsible for the behavior of police because of two reasons. Okay. You form the government and you have to pay for the behavior of police. And that's what we're going to go into in this particular discussion. I'm going to show you some examples. I'm going to show you some articles and I'm going to try to create a persuasive argument as to why your behavior, you're responsible for the behavior of police because of these particular two reasons. But really quickly, we're going to go into the sponsor of our show. That's www.thehighestpay.online option training academy. And that options training academy is designed to help people in society that are not making the money that they want to make with their nine to five. They don't like the fact that they got to take a lot of time away from their family to make the money that they make. And they don't understand why, even though inflation is going up, their money is not going up. So we're going to give a quick ad from our sponsor and then we're going to get back to the broadcast. The best thing about being an options trader is it allows me to homeschool my children. It's important that I teach them the right way to think about the world as early as possible. Here is a picture my son made for me during his art class. I think it's beautiful. Okay, so let's go right back to it, right? You're responsible for the behavior of police because of these two reasons. You form the government, you have to pay for the behavior of the police. Are you aware that when you live in a municipality, you live in a city, you live in a state, but also the federal government of the United States, it's you, the citizen, that formed the government. The government did not form itself. And then therefore, because you formed the government, you formed every government agency because you justify those government agencies. And then therefore, you're responsible for the behavior inside those government agencies. And therefore, whatever the actors inside those government agencies do, you're responsible. So we look at police as a government agency. You are responsible for their behavior. Okay, so it's the citizens fault for the behavior of the police because the citizens are responsible for the behavior of the police because they are an agent inside the government that they have formed. And they create legitimacy to the government. So the government is only legitimate because we say it is. It's not legitimate because they say they're legitimate. And the reason why the government is legitimate is because we continue to finance the government with our tax dollars. Because if we didn't believe the government was legitimate, then why pay taxes to them? Why participate in government on any level? Why vote? Why pay taxes? Why listen to anything that they say? If we don't believe the government is legitimate. So by participating in these things, we're giving legitimacy to the government. Therefore, if they're legitimate, then I'm responsible for what they do because I'm giving them legitimacy. Next point, the goal of certain factions is to keep the money flowing to them and to make you believe you don't have any authority over the situation. That's their goal. There are factions in government that operate. They they use tax dollars to to support themselves. And what they want to do is create a media campaign and a persuasion campaign to make you believe that you don't have any authority over the situation. That's their job. And so that's what they're investing in doing. And many people buy into that because they often don't know any better. And because that persuasion campaign is so thorough, it's so deep, and it's also supported by many of their politicians, right? And so that's something you have to understand. So this is why I want to really encourage you to understand your position in this and argue from your position. Don't argue from a position that you're not in, right? Another point that we're going to kind of continue to unfold. Uh, you're being told us about these individuals being harmed. When there's an issue with a police officer, it's not about the individual. It's never about that. However, this is what you've been programmed to understand. A lot of people, for some reason, they can't see things outside of certain contexts. Um, they can't see things outside of a certain position. Often I think people have a problem putting themselves in somebody else's position. Therefore, everything gets presented to them as an individual scenario, right? When you're dealing with government and you're dealing with government agents, it's always about the money. Because the only reason they're legitimate is because they get the money. If there's no money flowing through their agency, they don't have an agency. 
There's no such thing as a government agency that has zero dollars coming to it. So the agency doesn't exist anymore because there's no funding. Therefore, when I'm looking at any situation with policing, what I immediately see is what it's going to cost. That's all I see. Because I look at things as a business owner. So I look at what it's going to cost, right? Not saying I'm insensitive to the individual being harmed, but what I'm doing is I'm looking at the cost of the situation, right? So let me give you a really quick example of what I'm talking about. So looking at this situation right here, there was a situation happened earlier this year or either late last year in a place called Reform, Alabama. So this was a county police officer and this police officer tased a suspect while they were already handcuffed and it did not appear that they were resisting arrest, right? This kind of got some traction on the news. It's not about this individual being tased. It's not about that person. So therefore, when they go and pull up this person's social media and it shows that this person was making negative comments about black women, I don't care because it's not about that person. They're making negative comments about black people. I'm not really tripping because it's not about that person, right? So the first thing, this isn't my issue because I don't live in Reform, Alabama, but I'm looking at this from a larger issue. It's not about the person. The person doesn't have to be pristine for the issue still to be relevant. So what is this issue actually about? It's about the money that this is going to cost, right? So here's an article. The attorney is working to clear this person's name, right? And they say it. This guy, Washington, was charged with obstructing government operations, resisting arrest, marijuana possession, drug trafficking, possessing a firearm as an ex-felon, according to Pickens County Sheriff, right? On Wednesday, his attorney confirmed that the drug trafficking charge has been thrown out. He hopes to clear Washington's names entirely. He's going to file a $20 million lawsuit, right? We will not stop working until we clear Michael's name and hold all parties responsible. We're filing a $20 million lawsuit on the federal level against all responsible parties. What I'm looking at in this scenario is the money it's going to cost. That's what I'm seeing. I'm not worrying about whether or not this person is a pristine person. I'm looking at the money that this is going to cost somebody because of the behavior of these government agencies. Because this is going to cost somebody some money. Okay? Because when the government does something wrong in its capacity, the only real recourse is to sue the government that is responsible for putting these officers out into the community. That's how this is going to work. And so because people get caught up in the individual and yada, 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 because they don't understand the economic piece because that's they haven't been really educated and trained to understand that piece. All they can go on is the individual. I don't care about the individual because I'm looking at it. What is this going to cost at the end of the day to make this situation go away? So when you bring up the behavior of officers, they often throw in these red herrings like you don't understand the profession. Yada, yada, yada. You need to, you know, you should go on ride alongs, things of that nature. Let me explain something to you. I don't expect anybody to understand my business for me to do business properly. If I'm robbing and stealing from people, if I'm doing things incorrectly, if I'm breaking the law, that's not because well, people don't understand what I do for a living. There's millions of professions in the world that people have to adhere to rules and regulations and they have to make sure that they're operating under state law. They got to make sure they're operating under federal law. They got regulation that they have to operate under. None of them ever present to you that well, the reason why you don't understand what we're doing, if you say we're doing something wrong, is because you don't understand the profession. You haven't gone on a ride along. So this, again, we're going back to the same problem. This is a government agency. These people are a function of government. They're legitimate because, one, we give them our tax money, right? They're not in a position to demand anything from us except what we've already ag agreed they could demand from us. So an officer can only enforce laws that we agreed they can enforce. They can't enforce any other law except what we've agreed there. That's why they're in law enforcement. And I want you to really understand that the lack of civics in America is the reason why we have problems with people in government, right? Again, I don't have to understand the job of government agents. Why? Because I'm paying to finance the operations of government. We formed the government. The government did not form itself. If the government formed itself, it is an illegitimate government. So we got to roll this back to basic civics. We form government. If the government forms itself, it is an illegitimate government. That's like a feudal system. It's a monarchy. 
it's these forms of government that are really illegitimate because they were not formed by the people. If we form government, we can question any member of our government in any agent of our government because we formed them. So either it's a lack of confidence, it's a lack of understanding, a lack of intelligence. There's an apathy around it, but it is not improper for us to question the government that we form because the government is only legitimate because we formed them. They're not legitimate because they say so. So any agent or actor of our government that we formed, they're not legitimate because they say so. They're legitimate because we say so. And if we say they're no longer legitimate, then they're no longer legitimate because why? We formed a government and we can form whatever government we want to form. And so, like I said, it's a lack of civics. It's a lack of intelligence around this particular area or it's just a lack of apathy while people buy into everything else except the issue. It's weird to me that people do this, but I just think we're coming from two different perspectives. If I know I need a brake job, I'm not going to allow the mechanic to tell me I need a new engine because I know I need a brake job. So I'm not going to argue with the mechanic over the cost of a new engine because I know I need a brake job, right? So when the issue is that when I'm dealing with an agent of government, they can't get me to talk about anything else except my dis being displeased with their behavior as an agent of government. I don't need to go on a ride along. I don't need to learn the intricacies of their job, right? Because their job is to justify why they need my tax money. That's their only job. They don't have another job. My job is not to give them my tax money and then I got to justify why I have a problem with what they're doing. So I'm going to give you another example of what I'm talking about in this really quick video. I don't know. My legs went numb for a second. I heard a pop come from. Go this way. Can you move? Yeah. We hold our officers to a very high standard of service. And this particular time, we let the public down. Okaloosa County Sheriff Eric Aiden in this video posted to social media speaking on the incident of November 12th, 2023. While on a call with a suspect in the back seat, then Okaloosa County Deputy Jesse Hernandez reportedly claimed it was this noise that he thought was the detained suspect shooting at him. Shots fired! Shots fired! Hernandez and Okaloosa County Sheriff's Sergeant Beth Roberts, who was on the scene, both shot into the patrol car. The detained person in the back seat was reportedly not physically injured. Officials say he was fully searched before he was put into the patrol car and after the incident, but he was found to be unarmed. The noise was reported to be an acorn. Hernandez resigned just weeks later. We have an obligation to our staff to try and train them the best we can so that they can go home unharmed to their families. But we have just as equally and just as important of an obligation to our public. Even if they're being investigated for a felony crime, we have that same obligation to protect them. In a recently released 44-page report of an internal investigation, it states Hernandez used excessive force. But for Roberts... Jesse, how are you? The report stated her response was in an effort to save Hernandez's life and that her response was reasonable. Sheriff Aiden offered his apologies to the man who was in the patrol car. We are so grateful and prayful and thankful that, that, that he was not injured. In Okaloosa County, Claire Jones, News Channel 7. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and time. Okay, so that was the issue that happened in Florida. That area is kind of like in the panhandle, the northwest part of the panhandle. It's a county that doesn't really have a lot of people inside of it. And what I want to get people to kind of understand is that that is an example of what I'm talking about. Okay? And when this example came out, for some reason, people thought this was, like, funny. There was something hilarious about the situation. They made a lot of jokes about it, yada, yada, yada. Um, to me, this is a classic example of a person that is an agent of government that is pretty much out of position. They're in the wrong profession and it's going to cost the taxpayers a lot of money now. Right. So the question I had once I watched this and I saw people's reaction to it, you know, you got the people that are formal law enforcement. They got really big channels. They're supposed to be the experts at breaking down police videos. And they try to make this seem like this was like humorous. And I'm trying to figure out what is funny about this situation. Right. The officers or the two officers shot multiple times into a car because they lacked bearing one 
and they lacked emotional control. Right. So you have two officers that have been given law enforcement responsibilities. They've been given a large amount of discretion in public. They have the ability to use deadly force to the public to enforce the laws that we said are legitimate, that we want to get enforced, right? They have police powers. They have the ability to arrest people. And we're seeing that they lack any bearing. And bearing, what I mean is that you have the ability to control yourself in a stressful situation. And I've been saying this for years. Many people that we have working in enforcement, they lack bearing. There's a guy on YouTube that's a former officer, even though he didn't really work that long, but he used that kind of as a way to try to create legitimacy for himself on social media. And there's a video on YouTube in which he shows you that he has no bearing. He doesn't have any bearing at all, has no emotional control. And this guy's claim to fame was that he was an officer, yada, yada, yada. But you see that he lacks any bearing. And we've seen situation of a situation of a situation. For many of these officers that get in trouble, we can see that they lack bearing. My question is, how come bearing wasn't trained into them from the onset? And if they don't have the bearing, they should not be allowed to go into the public with police powers, the ability to use discretion if they want to kill somebody because they think that's legitimate. When they show on the front for on the front that they don't have the bearing and they also don't have the emotional control. And you need those things in these jobs. Being an officer is very stressful because you got to come in contact with the public over and over and over and over and over again. And therefore, if you're not up to doing that and you're not up to dealing with people all day, you probably need to go find another profession. And in 2024, there's so many things you can do because of the Internet and because of social media. There's so many ways to make money. You don't just have to be an officer because you can't figure out anything else. You can do something else with your life. Right. But this is a classic example of these two people. Now, what I want you to understand is this. The suspect inside the car will sue the county. 100%. I guarantee you lawyers immediately reached out to that dude and said, we got a lawsuit because you are a suspect inside a car. You've been searched. They found no weapon on you when they searched you. You didn't resist arrest. They put you inside the back seat of a car while they're doing their investigation, right? You comply. You don't do, you don't resist at all. While you're inside the car, this officer loses their bearing and they start shooting inside the car. And let me show you what he did. A lot of people are not going to peep because they don't know the games these people play. He emptied the magazine. And they're taught to do this because they're taught to say, I was so fearful of my life. I emptied the magazine into this person. So you'll be dead. You can't contradict nothing that they're saying. You understand what I'm going to tell you? So he emptied his whole magazine into that car. The other officer and really, you can tell, again, a lack of training because she created crossfire from the angle that she was shooting at the other guy that was shooting. They really probably should have shot each other. But they're such bad shots, they couldn't even hit each other. Right. She also shoots inside the car on a suspect that they had already searched and found to be unarmed. He's going to sue the county. One hundred percent. Right. And so now this is going to cost the taxpayers money. So it's not about whether or not this person is a good person. It's not about whether or not we're going to go through their social media history and find something negative. It's not about they got a picture on Facebook with them holding a gun. That has nothing to do with this specific incident of agents of our government. So the people of that particular county have, have essentially said these people are qualified to act on our behalf to enforce the laws in our county. Right. And we believe these people to be qualified to do that. They're now going to cost that county a lot of money because he's going to sue that company. Again, officer was allowed to resign. Why was he not fired because of gross incompetence? Name another profession where you can be an employee and exhibit such incompetence. And they say, well, you know what? We'll just let you resign. It won't happen. I, I worked a job in medical. You made three mistakes in a year, they fire you. That's it. There's going to be no retraining. You make three mistakes in one year, they fire you. Because we're dealing with information in the medical space to where if you get it wrong, it can impact somebody's treatment and kill them. So you got three mistakes to make in one year. After that, after that, really after the first mistake, you need to go look for another job. But most definitely after the second mistake, you need to go look for another job. Unless you figure you can you can work mistake free the rest of the year. But I worked in the medical profession and you had three mistakes to make in one year. After you made three mistakes, they fire you. One going to be no, you're going to resign. You're fired because you don't even know you made a mistake. 
They just walk into the office and fire you. Why was he not fired? And so, again, it is my theory that his faction can influence the sheriff and influence government to not fire officers, allow them to resign. So what does that mean? He can go to another department and get another job. But he doesn't need to be in this profession because why? He doesn't have emotional control. He doesn't have bearing. Therefore, he'll do what? He will do this again. He'll do this again. If he's allowed to continue to operate as an officer, he will do this again. And so by him doing this again, the situation can go from bad to worse. And I'm going to show you an example about that later on in the video of an officer that was a bad agent. He was a bad operator. It wasn't nipped in the bud early on, and it cost our country a lot of money. But nobody wants to talk about that. They want to talk about everything else except this person and what they did that cost people a lot of money. Like I said, I run a business. I hire people for my business. I look at the money it's going to take and I look at the time it's going to take. That's all I look at. I got a person right now that I'm, con I'm contracted with. I got a disagreement because they costing me time. And I'm trying to explain to this person, my time equals money. I'm not paying you to cost me time. I'm paying you to free my time up. You understand me? And therefore, as a taxpayer, the city or the county or the state is part of your business. Why? Because it's being financed with your money. It's not being financed by somebody else's money. But because they've convinced you that it's not, it's about these weird issues that got nothing to do with money and financing and tax paying. You get caught into the red herring. And the reason why they don't allow me to talk about this stuff, because we're going to start bringing out budgets. We're going to start bringing out spreadsheets. And we're going to start talking about what does this stuff cost us? And they don't want to ever talk about it from that point because they want to be allowed to keep doing what they're doing, which is their goal. Their goal, again, we got factions. They want to get money from the taxpayers. And they don't want everybody to hold them responsible for their behavior. That's what they want to do. We're not saying all of them want to do that, but there's a large amount of people in these factions. That's what they want to do, right? Again, why would you allow bad government agents to represent you in government? It's going to cost you money. And not only the money is going to cost you directly, you can be cost money and miss opportunities because you're allowing bad agents in government to represent you. Because they're, they're you on the street. So if you're working a nine to five and you paying money, you paying taxes and you got your family and hold down yards, you need these government agents to act on your best behalf because they're really acting as you because you can't. They're your agent. Same way where I'm a ball player. I hire somebody to negotiate a contract for me. They're acting on my behalf in the go in the contracts. I can't have them not doing their job because it's going to impact the contract that I get. So I'm hiring this person to represent my best interest. That's the role of government. The role of government, again, is to, to is to essentially make your life easier, not make your life harder. But because we don't really know what government is and because we're apathetic or we lack the intelligence or maybe a combination of all three, we allow government to essentially form themselves and then to do what they want to do with your money. It's not their money. They don't have any money. All the money comes from you. Then when you say, hey, I'm displeased with what government is doing, they they create what they want the narrative to be. So you can never get to the point to where you're doing this with my money. Why are you doing this with my money? And two, why am I allowing you to do it? Right? So let's talk about an agent of government representing people. And hopefully YouTube lets me play these videos and don't take the stream down. On a Saturday night in Greek town, two summers ago, Marcus Austin and his friends were downtown celebrating a friend's upcoming wedding. The night began like any other. Pretty typical. We were just climbing around, having fun. But as police body cam would show, the fun came to an end after 2 a.m. when officers flooded Monroe Street, trying to clear out the remaining crowds. As he was walking to his car, Marcus said officers turned him and his friends around and sent them in another direction. They told us to go back the other way. But before we even got all the way back around, the melee happened. Push them out. Get out the way. Get out the way or you're going to be in a knockout zone. Officers were seen pushing back groups of young men and women still lingering. That's when the police tried to pat one of them down. And from there, it just broke. They just started putting hands on them. At first, Marcus says officers focused their attention on a different group that was downtown that night. Body cam shows a team of officers descending on two men wearing ski masks, delivering repeated punches and knee strikes. <laughs> And the punches continued, even knocking off an officer's camera. 
At the same time down the street, another group of officers had surrounded Marcus and his friends. This man, pulled down from behind by an officer, who seconds later begins delivering repeated punches. Then, Officer Kyrie Roberts is seen shoving a different man to the ground before another man was thrown down too. It was then that Marcus can be heard demanding officers' badge numbers. They got attacked by the police. Usually when we see something like that, it's getting swept under the rug, so I just spoke up. And after he did, an officer was seen grabbing onto him, pushing Marcus back before shoving him into the middle of the street. I get up off the ground and then it's lights out. I never see the punch coming. Hey, I ain't do that, dog. The punch was delivered by Officer Kyrie Roberts and it knocked Marcus out. Once he was on the ground, officers did not render aid according to a DPD investigation. Instead, they yelled at him to get up. Get up! Get up! Don't walk with my partner, get up! Go! Go! Seconds later, Officer Roberts would leave Marcus in the street and not long after turn off his body camera. No officer could be seen rendering aid, including a supervisor, Sergeant Scott Barrick, who would later be reprimanded. Marcus says he was later diagnosed with a concussion and herniated disc. Egregious, uh, offensive, unnecessary, unprovoked. Johnny Hawkins is Marcus's attorney, who filed suit against the city alleging police brutality. Kyrie Roberts, he's a bully, and he enjoys his job. That's the way it looked to me. After the punch, Detroit police would suspend Officer Roberts and launch an investigation, which, in July, concluded that he punched Marcus without justification. Even worse, it found that Roberts was not truthful to investigators, claiming that he saw Marcus strike an officer in the head with an unknown object before punching him. But video showed no evidence an officer was struck with anything. Roberts also claimed he saw Marcus raise his left hand with a closed fist, but look at the video. It shows, and DPD agrees, Roberts wasn't making a fist at all. I wouldn't want him on my roster. That's a clear liability. But he wasn't terminated. Uh, he didn't give them a chance. With internal charges looming, Roberts resigned from Detroit on September 16th. Then, just 10 days later, there he was being sworn in at East Point PD, just down the street. Why would East Point want to hire an officer that Detroit was preparing to fire? Again, I'm not going to count on that. We had questions for East Point's public safety director, George Rohib, who we found at last week's city council meeting. He was found to have used excessive force. He was found to have lied. He was found to have left a man in the street that he had not unconscious. Why was this an officer you wanted to hire? Again, I will not comment on that. It's under review right now. Rohib would not say if he knew about the internal charges lodged against Roberts, but acknowledged he did not see the video of the punch when he hired him. In fact, the very first time he ever saw it was when we showed it to him. We should seen the video before you hired? Well, you know, everyone makes mistakes, and, um, you know, we've taken a lot of chances on officers, and actually they're really good officers. He shouldn't be protecting and serving anybody anywhere. You're unleashing them from one bad... Okay, and so... Here's what I want people to understand. And I've said this before. You have agents of government. They are out in the community and they're doing what they think is necessary. The issue is that after the action takes place and they go file the incident report, the incident report don't match up what's on camera. So my question is why you feel like you need to lie about what took place. And so this is why and some of y'all going to be too young to remember this. Because some of y'all was born like right during the cell phone era. There was an era before cell phones. So I'm talking about the old, like the flip phones with the cameras on it. And a lot of police officers really protested and had issue with people filming them. Because for years, an officer or a group of officers could in come and encounter with a citizen or a resident. And something would take place. And... They would create an incident report or create you know, the affidavit. And then whatever they said happened, the judge would take their word for it because it would be their word against yours. Nobody, unless somebody else would come in and say, you know what, that, that's not what happened, which normally doesn't happen. There would be nobody to contradict what they said. And therefore, people would get away with a lot of bad behavior 
because the judge would always believe the officer. What we're seeing now well, because of, of cameras, because of cell phones, that they can't do that anymore, but they're still trying to do it. So we, we saw in this particular video, this officer was engaged in this particular situation. And then when he went back and he, he wrote the incident report, what he put on the incident report was totally different than what happened on video. That's the problem. It's not what happened. It's the fact that you lied about it. So my question is, if I'm a, a resident or a citizen of the city of Detroit, if you lie about that, what else are you going to lie about? Or what else have you already lied about? Can I trust any incident report that you write? Because what you show me is that you'll lie on paper. You won't lie verbally. You'll lie on paper. Right? And so I think this is what people are not realizing. This has happened multiple times. The guy that shot the, um, the guy, I believe, in Charleston years ago, right? Not only did he move the taser from one scene, part of the scene, to the other part of the scene that was on video. Not only did he do that, when he gave the incident report of the situation, the incident report that he gave, it didn't match what was on camera. So if that videotape of him shooting that guy never came out, we just would have had to go on what he said because the other guy's dead. He can't contradict it. And we know that a lot of times officers won't break out of the pack and say, well, you know what? It didn't really go like that. They, they go along with the program. So the other officer on the scene, he's not going to contradict them. So that's all we have to go on is this incident report. So when the video came out, it's when he got in trouble. If the video never comes out, that man is still probably in the force right now today. Because all we had to go on was what he said took place. See, so people go, go about whether the dude should have paid his child support, yada, yada, yada. Even if the shooting was justified, why you felt like you needed to lie about it? You see what I'm saying? So that's what people got to understand. So that's part one of this particular video. We're going to keep going with the story. Let's go to the next one. He's the Detroit police officer who knocked out a man with a single punch. And afterwards, DPD said he was not truthful about how it all happened. But before the department got a chance to fire him, that officer got a new job down the road. Seven investigator Ross Jones has more on how the community is reacting to his latest investigation and why the state is stepping in. We should not have to learn about this on the news. We should have been told about this. At last night's meeting of the East Point City Council, our investigation caught the public's attention. Anyone who is not a police officer, if they punched somebody out like that, knocked them unconscious, they would be charged with battery. As we reported last night, Officer Kyrie Roberts faced termination in Detroit after punching out this man, Marcus Alston, on camera. DPD found that Roberts punched him without justification, that he failed to render aid after knocking him out, and that he was not truthful with investigators. But before DPD got a chance to fire Roberts, East Point Police hired him back in September. Did the department drop the ball here? No, not, not at all. How are you so confident? We're not the licensing authority. The state of Michigan is, and we go by what they say. Public Safety Director George Rohib said his department did nothing wrong in hiring Roberts and insists their background check into the officer was thorough. Rohib said he knew Wayne County's prosecutor declined to bring criminal charges against Roberts, but admitted he never even saw the video of Roberts punching Alston until we showed it to him. Could this have been a thorough background check if he didn't even pull up the video that was all over social media? I would say no. Cardi DeMonico has been a city council member in East Point for the last eight years and says his public safety director needs to be transparent about what the department knew of Robert's history at DPD and why he decided to give him a badge. Are you comfortable hiring this officer? I would certainly have to say no. I would have not hired this officer knowing all this. The MCOLS Act requires that every agency perform a comprehensive background investigation to determine character fitness. Tim Burgoys is executive director of MCOLS, the state agency that licenses every officer in Michigan. When an officer leaves a department for whatever reason, their license is deactivated. And before another agency can hire that officer, they need to demonstrate that their license is in good standing. M. Coles is now looking into what happened here, but already there are signs that both departments may have dropped the ball. Detroit police, we've learned, didn't report that Roberts had left their department until October 10th, weeks after he resigned and East Point had already hired him. When they finally did, 
They reported his license was in good standing, even though he was facing serious charges that could have led to his firing. As for East Point, their public safety director told me he was unaware Roberts was facing any internal charges while at DPD. And as of last week, he has declined to take my calls. Well, we are concerned. We have received information that indicates that perhaps this operation was not in good standing. We don't know that for sure yet, and so we'll investigate that. I understand EPD is short-staffed, but I'll tell you what, I'd rather we're short-staffed than have somebody like that in our department. That's putting all of us at risk. And we have tried repeatedly to reach East Point's mayor and city manager for comment on this story, but neither have returned our calls. Tonight, Officer Roberts remains at East Point. Okay, and so let's go to the conclusion of this particular story. And heads up, I want to give that news outlet a lot of credit for doing real journalism. This is real. What you're seeing with them is real journalism. We're actually investigating stories. You're going and talking to people. You're doing research. Journalism is not just I'm finding somebody you know, on Instagram or calling them a scammer and making a video about it, right? This is real journalism. And the problem why we don't see a lot of this anymore, because it takes a lot of time and money to do this type of research, because every story is not going to hit. You might, you know, hit a dead end. But this is the type of journalism I was raised on. But you don't see a lot of this anymore because it takes time to actually do it, takes money. And what most people want is somebody just to come on YouTube and tell them what they want to hear. Let's get to the conclusion of the story. A troubled East Point police officer has had to turn in his badge. It's just the latest fallout from a 7 Action News investigation. And it may not be the end of that officer's problems. 7 Investigator Ross Jones has more. The whole system as a whole failed. We shouldn't have hired Mr. Roberts. Officer Kyrie Roberts avoided accountability in Detroit for this punch by leaving DPD before they could fire him and joining East Point. But Robert's past finally caught up with him, with the city confirming this week he has resigned. When I first got here to East Point back in July... After our first story in May, Interim Chief Corey Haynes was appointed to lead the department, replacing the man who hired Roberts last year. George Rohib was aware of Robert's troubles in Detroit, but still gave him a badge. By phone, Chief Haynes told me that he gave Roberts a choice, resign or be terminated. Summary suspensions are issued to protect the citizens. Last week, we told you how the state has stepped in, issuing an emergency suspension for Robert's license after what we revealed, that Roberts was accused in Detroit of punching a man who posed no threat, that he later lied to investigators about it and failed to render aid. We have to be able to trust that people tell the truth, particularly in official proceedings and official police reports. That's very concerning and, and certainly the use of force in this situation is concerning. Well, Roberts is out of a job tonight, things could still get worse. He is awaiting an administrative hearing with the state where he will fight to save his law enforcement license. A date for that hearing has not yet been set, but it is safe to assume that tonight, after leaving this police department, Roberts won't be joining another. The buck still was with us and who we hire. We should be doing our thorough investigation doing the background checks, knowing all this information before we hire officers. We could not reach Officer Roberts about his resignation. He has pre- So that's the conclusion of that story. So we see that he was able to move from one department to another department, even though he had a lot of bad stuff on his record. And there's also been a lot of, how would I say, actions by factions in this particular part of government to where they don't want the disciplinary record of an officer to be available to the public. So you won't even know that this person's a bad operator in the state, right? So the question, what officer is worth the money paid out when a lawsuit was settled? Now we talked about in this earlier story, that that person that got hit is going to sue the city of Detroit. Is that officer that was involved in that, are they worth the money that's going to be paid out? Because one thing I learned about running a business, if you hire somebody, they need to often be worth three times what you pay a minimum, right? They need to be worth three times what you pay the minimum. Therefore, if I have an officer that's engaged in, act, in, in behavior and it's going to cost me a payout, are they worth it? What about their job activity is worth what I'm going to have to pay out to keep them on the job? How do I justify this financially, keeping them there? 
So this is why I don't argue over whether or not the person was a thug or this chick really was a nurse or she wasn't a nurse. I don't argue any of that. My question is, I am invested in the financial health of this particular city. I'm responsible for it because I'm a taxpayer. What about this city employee is worth the money that we're going to have to pay out to solve this situation? Why are they worth that to us? Because if this particular person, any of them, the guy that shot the, uh, the people in Florida thought he heard an acorn, I thought he heard a bullet, but it really was an acorn. If he was working for a private business, they would sit back and say, why is this guy worth the money that we're going to have to pay for his mistake? What if he makes another mistake? What is it going to be worth to us? And they're going to do their calculations and they're going to come up with, you know what? We got to get this guy out of here because he's not worth it. Right. And so I think because, again, they've conditioned the resident or the citizen to not see themselves as being invested in the financial health of the city. We often don't think about these things and then they bring in this, that and the third as what this is supposed to be about. And like I said, that gets most people what it won't get me, which is why they don't let me on their shows to talk about it. Because what we're going to start doing is we're going to bring our spreadsheets, we're going to bring our budgets, we're going to bring out how much it costs to, to keep these people on the job. What is it costing us to keep these people on the job? What will it cost for us to replace this person on the job? Is that less than what we got to pay to keep the person? That's how I'm going to look at it. And because they don't want that to be the conversation, because people will finally start to realize this is what it's costing us for us to continue to make things go the way it's going. Let's go to the next example. Let me get rid of that. Let me go here. So here is city of Memphis, right? This is from June 28th, 2023. The city of Memphis approved the $794 million budget for the 2024 fiscal year. No property tax increase and a big raise for police and firefighters. Memphis police officers and firefighters will get a 14% pay raise making them the highest paid public, public safety employees in the region. Here's another art about Tyree Nichols. People might remember he got killed not too long ago, right? So Tyree Nichols' family files federal $550 million civil lawsuit against Memphis and the police officers. Okay, so I want you to contrast these. The lawsuit about the Tyree's nickel is $550 million. That's the lawsuit. Now, we know that they're going to they gonna come high. They're probably going to meet somewhere in the middle. But let's just go what we got on face value. It's 550 million, right? That's that's the lawsuit. The budget for the year is 794. What about those officers is worth that much money? Because we know what the budget is now. So this is the whole city budget, right? For the year. What about these officers and what they're doing? What value are they bringing to the city of Memphis that's worth 550? I'm asking you to speak, look at it like a business owner. What value are they bringing to the table that is worth $550 million? And we're operating on an $800 million budget for the year. What value do they bring? Is, is, it, is there something intrinsic? Is there something extrinsic? Is there something implicit or explicit? What value do they bring that we can attach a monetary dollar amount to that is worth $550 million? So they quit and go away tomorrow. Who cares? Because by having them on the job, they were they, they're costing me five hundred fifty million dollars. Why would I let somebody work in my business and they're costing me more money than what they're making me? Why would I allow that if I'm running a business? You understand what I'm trying to tell you? So all these people saying we want politicians and we want people that's going to run the government like a business. No, you don't. Because when these situations get presented in front of you, you jump on everything else except the business part of it. What about these officers and what they were doing is worth $550 million? It really got to be worth three times that for us to justify paying this out behind their behavior. Let's keep going. So this particular team they was on called the Scorpion Unit, right? You know, they on these little, these little uh, task force, okay? So the department unit that beat up Tyree Nichols was part of the division that operated with an annual budget of more than $28 million a year from its creation, Right? Memphis spends more on policing than any almost almost any other service provided by the city. In 2022, the department's police budget was 27 275 million or almost 40% of the city 
total that year. So they're getting 40% of the budget in 2022, right? Of that sum, 28.3 million was allocated to a division for special operations that include organized crime, which houses the Scorpion unit. So inside that, inside that 28.3 is why I had the Scorpion unit. Okay, so the Scorpion unit was getting part of this 28.3. Part of that 28 million could cost the city 550 million. What value are they bringing to the city to where it justifies that? So we paying out the 28, it's going to cost us 550. How does that make business sense? So, so I'm going to ask you, I'm going to do a deal with you, right? I'm going to do a deal with you, right? You pay 28 million and it costs you 550. And you say yes to that contract. Does that make sense to you? Business wise, you pay 28 million and in a year it's going to cost you 550. You already paid out of 28 though. How does this make sense business wise? But when you object to it, then they, they, they spin every story except that story. This makes no sense business wise. Right. In a city with 24 percent poverty rate. And the police getting 40% of the budget. What value am I getting from you? I'm giving you 40% of the budget, but you're going to cost me $550 million. You see why they won't let me on no city council? Because that's all I want to talk about. You're getting 40% of the budget and you're going to cost me $550. This don't make, this don't add up. And you're getting a 14% raise. This don't make sense. So like I said, because we have allowed this situation to so separate itself from the public, Nobody asks these kind of questions because they're being told to talk about everything else except this. Okay, let's keep going. We talked about that. So here's the next point we want to go into. Why officers not fired and allowed to resign? How come when they do something wrong on their job, we've seen in all these situations, these officers after doing these egregious things, they're just allowed to just resign. They just can walk away. How come? And you'll find if you really do a lot of research, they get sweetheart deals when they do something wrong on their job that allow them to walk away from the job and not have that firing on their record. And a lot of people don't get them type of sweetheart deals. And the public is fine with it. They don't care. Let's keep going. Do you know the certification process for your state? Do you even know that officers have to be certified? So all these Negroes on YouTube talking about licenses and credentials. Do you know that officers have to be certified in most states? Pretty much all states now. Cali just changed their certification rules. I think Hawaii, you still don't have to be certified. Do you know that licenses that officers have to be certified? How come when we have an issue with an officer, we just don't say, hey, let's get this person to certify? How can we talk about all this kind of stuff? Citizens review boards, yada, yada, yada. If you need a license to operate, why don't we just go after your license and don't let you operate anymore? Then we ain't got to worry about you doing anything wrong because you can't do it. Then you can go to a whole nother state and go through that process again, but you can no longer operate in this state. But many people don't even know that officers have to be certified to operate in the actual state that they're operating in. So this is the issue. Because, again, lack of understanding of the issue, lack of intelligence around the issue and apathy is where you get caught up going back and forth. Let me explain something to you. I pay too much in taxes. I pay people a lot of money to try to figure out how I can avoid taxes. The amount of money I paid in taxes in 2022 was ridiculous because I didn't have these people on my team. Right. Really, my bad. 2021, 2022, it wasn't as bad because I had somebody on my team. The amount of money I pay in taxes, the amount of money I got to pay to try to mitigate some of my taxes. I'm not arguing with anybody in government. I'm not arguing with them. I pay. I live in the state of Georgia. I pay state taxes here, too. Right. I'm not arguing with anybody in government. We're not going to argue. Right. There's not going to be a go back and forth over how you're going to deal with me. And I'm paying for everything. I just I don't I won't even my, I can't even get myself emotionally to even entertain that type of stuff with them. Because I know where I fit in this structure and I'm the person financing everything. Right. So, again, because we don't often understand these things and we just get caught up in what somebody else tells us, we end up arguing the wrong point. Next point before we get up on out of here. The media is lying to you about officers. And the reason why they're doing this is because they know you're not going to read. The media is lying to you. Right. 
many people don't really understand how this media, quote unquote, media system works. You don't see people doing the type of actual investigative reporting, real investigative reporting, like the people we saw looking at that particular officer. Because why? It makes you an enemy of a lot of people. And it don't allow you to be part of the in crowd. A lot of the people that you think in media that are giving you, quote unquote, alternative news, they part of the same crowd that they call the mainstream news. They are part of the same crowd. One, because let me explain something to you. Unless you go do investigative reporting, all the news comes from the same two or three sources. Most people don't know that. So all the news comes from the same two or three sources. And I'm talking about mainstream news. I'm talking about financial news. Most people only get mainstream news. Same news comes from Reuters, comes from AP, and comes from one other source. That's pretty much where all the news outlets come from. Then they just take the news, they put their little spin on it. They don't go and look into nothing. So the media is lying to you about officers on both sides of the political spectrum because they know you won't read. Let me give an example of what I'm talking about before we get up on out of here. So you're going to hear a lot about the George Floyd situation. And so people that are kind of like want to try to come from more of the, the right of, of the situation and they call themselves conservatives, which is a very ambiguous word now, kind of like calling yourself a Christian. Um, they often want to talk about George Floyd being this terrible person and him being a fentanyl guy and him, uh, uh, I think, assaulting a pregnant woman. I think that was his girlfriend and all those things are true. We're not going to say it wasn't true. It was true. Now, I'm not going to say that he didn't die because he wasn't choked to death. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to go that far with it. But George Floyd had a very uh, bad criminal record before he was killed by this police officer. Right. A lot of things can be true at the same time. So they'll try to use that to try to say, well, you know what? This situation with with Chauvin is just political and he was at the right wrong place at the right time or yada, yada, yada. If he wasn't trying to pass counterfeit money, none of it would have happened, yada, yada, yada. And so that's how all this started. I want you to understand something. Chauvin pled guilty to federal crimes. OK, he didn't just plead guilty to the situation with George Floyd. But see, the media don't talk about that because they know you're not going to read. So they use George Floyd as a headline because they know that's going to trend because that's the, you know, the trigger point for all this other stuff. But I'm going to show you that Chauvin was a bad operator. And his disciplinary record showed he was a bad operator, but they couldn't get rid of the guy. So the city of Minneapolis couldn't get rid of this guy. He was a terrible professional. He really should have been fired, not allowed to resign a long time ago. And he probably should have been decertified in the state of Minnesota so he could no longer operate as an officer because he was a bad operator and his disciplinary record showed that. So what happened was things built up, built up, built up, built up till we got to the situation with George Floyd. And then now that's the tipping point of what we call in calculus, the inflection point. But this is the article I want you to peep. It's from justice.gov. So this is a government website. This is not a blog. This ain't put up by some left wing or right wing person. It's Office of Public Affairs. Derek Chauvin sentenced to more than 20 years in prison for depriving George Floyd and a minor victim of their constitutional rights, right? December 15, 2021, Chauvin pled guilty in federal court to violating a federal criminal civil rights statute on two separate occasions. We talk about George Floyd. Then we go into Chauvin also pled guilty or pleaded guilty to willfully depriving a then 14-year-old child of his constitutional right to be free from the use of unreasonable force by a police officer resulting in a child's bodily injury. The U.S. attorney Luger said Derek Chauvin abandoned his sworn oath to uphold the sanctity of life when he callously took George Floyd's life and when he violently assaulted a 14-year-old child. According to the plea agreement, Chauvin admitted that on September 4th, 2017, he willfully violated the 14-year-old's constitutional right to be free from an officer's use of unreasonable force. Chauvin admitted that he held the child by the throat and struck the child multiple times in the head with a flashlight, resulting in the child's bodily injury. In the plea agreement, Chauvin also admitted that, that he held his knee on the child's neck, shoulder, and upper back for between 15 and 16 minutes, even though the child was face down on the floor, handcuffed and not resisting. Chauvin admitted that these actions resulted in the child's bodily injury. So this happened in 2017. The situation with George Floyd happened in 2020. How come in 2017 somebody didn't put a stop to this dude? 
See what I told you about these people doing this stuff and it keep building up and building up and building up. So now this is on a government website. It's in front of everybody. But when the media talks about this issue, they only talk about George Floyd. They don't talk about that this man pled guilty in federal court to doing this on two separate occasions. One that happened three years before 2020. Right. This was already a bad operator. He was a bad professional and he should not have he should not have been given the power that he was being given by the city of Minneapolis. He wasn't responsible enough to have this kind of power. He needed to go sell insurance or something. This dude owned a home in Windermere. I don't know how he affords a home in Windermere with a cop salary, but that's a whole nother story. Because most people, because they don't know the Windermere area, which is right outside of Orlando, they don't even know how much homes cost out there. I don't know how a cop in Minneapolis, Minnesota can afford a home in Windermere. But that's a whole nother story. So ain't no telling what this man really involved in. He probably linked up with them Somalians getting it back and forth. He ain't no telling. You feel me? But that's what I want you to understand. This person was a bad operator and it kept building up and building up and building up. And then you get the situation in 2020 with George Floyd. That becomes a trigger point of what we call the inflection point. Now, let me explain something to you. Here's an article from Minnesota Reformer from building damage to police payouts. The cost of, of Floyd's killings are piling up, right? The governor of the state estimated and damage in the Twin Cities and surrounding suburbs based on the riots would total more than $500 million, making it the second cost of civil disturbance in the U.S. history. Again, the question I want to ask you, what about Chauvin and his performance on the job? And what about the value that he's bringing to the city of Minneapolis is worth $500 million? Why is it so important to keep this guy on this force? And to put the risk of this guy continuing to do things wrong in the community and it'd be worth so much money when it all goes bad. What? So he must have been worth two billion dollars a year to Minneapolis. For us to have to repair the city at a five hundred million dollar price point. You see what I'm saying? And so what I want you to understand is that when you don't get these people out of the way and have them go do something else with their life, they're going to cost the city or the state or the county money down the line. This guy in Florida that said he heard a, a, a gunshot, but it was an acorn and he emptied his old magazine inside a car. He's going to cost a municipality. He's going to cost a county or he's going to cost a state a lot of money. Because if he continues to operate as an officer, he's going to do something even worse because he is emotionally unhinged. He's proven it. This is what I want you to understand. But it's the citizens fault because they allow this stuff to go on. And then when something happens, they go to a town hall meeting and they start talking about all this uh, racism and all this stuff. I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about how your department cost me money is going to cost me more money because of the people in your department. And why should I pay for that? I need you to justify in documentation and paperwork why you think you're valued at these particular numbers, because that's what I'm paying for. Right. What value do you bring to justify these numbers? But see, as a labor union, all they can do, the only negotiating power they got is a labor stoppage. So this is what they try to control you with is, well, if you don't go along with our demands, we'll just stop doing work. Then they get the media to talk about crime went up, yada, yada, yada. But Memphis is paying their police department. How much? Let's go back to it. $794 million budget, but the police budget was how much? 2022, 275 million. Memphis is paying their police almost $300 million. And everybody know what time it is in Memphis. Them people in Memphis will kill you. So we paying the police almost $300 million to police Memphis. And Memphis is turned up the way it's turned up. So what is what value are we getting for our money? Because you can't police crime away. It don't work that way. You got to build people up to get rid of crime. You can't police crime away. It's never That's never worked. We know that because of the war on drugs. We know that because of mass incarceration. They did all that. We still got crime. Crime has gone down. Murders have gone down. We still got crime, though, because you can't police crime away. You have to improve people's lives to where they got something else to do besides be a criminal. But that's what I want you to understand. Because we never put the numbers on the table and we never talk to numbers, we get sidetracked with all this other stuff. So then when an officer does something, people 
they create a narrative. The, the media mainstream says, okay, we'll create a narrative. We'll say it was about this. Then some people argue that, and the other people give the counterpoint. And they build their audience either on making the point or the counterpoint, and people rally around either just a point or the counterpoint. I'm coming in and saying, how much is it going to cost us? That's all I care about. But because we can't ever look at the numbers that it's costing us, because they don't want you to look at that part of it, because then you start to really understand this is what I'm responsible for in the government that I created. So that's all I want to talk about. Not going to be the dead horse. We already had an hour. Right. But I want you to understand when you see this stuff going on it's your fault. It's your fault because you're going for it. And until you step in and say, I'm not going for this anymore, until you understand that you form government, government does not form itself. If a government forms itself, it's not legitimate. And they're going to try to do a lot of things to scare you. They're going to try to do a lot of things to make you think it got to go a certain way. You got factions that need your money. They don't have anything unless they can get your money. They're going to try to scare you. And if it works, they're going to just keep going along the way they're going. But what we're having in America is we're having government really getting separate from the citizens. And this is what you see in other parts of the world where the situation is very, very terrible because the government and the citizens are, are not in day away from each other. They're not together because the citizens don't feel that they're invested in what goes on inside the government and the government don't care as long as they keep getting the money. So that's going to be it. We're not going to be here too long. If you have any comments, questions or disagreements, we always welcome those. We can come up. We're going to read these super chats, man. We're going to go home. That's been pinned. Go ahead and read these super chats. Ray go, man. Appreciate the two dollar super chat, man. Girls with pearls, appreciate it. She says, teach the people, appreciate it, trying to. Uh, or we appreciate the 499, man. Mr. Terrence F, thank you for your hard work. Appreciate the 499, Mr. Terrence. Miss Phoenix 91, appreciate the $5. She says, 2.6 billion is the current Detroit budget. It will be interesting to see the mayor's proposed 2024 budget next Thursday. Miss Phoenix, I saw a video and I was going to put it in here, but I didn't want to just put too many videos in here. There's a cop in Detroit. I think he's cost the city. It's either $20 million or $200 million. Either way, it's too much money. There's one individual officer in the city of Detroit. It's either $20 million or $200 million. But either way, it's too much money. He's cost as an individual, right? And so that's the problem is that these people are allowed to cost the city or cost the county or cost the municipality large amounts of money. And my question is, what value do they bring to justify what they're costing us? Well, we're not supposed to ask that question. We're supposed to just let these people just keep doing what they're doing. So Robbie Rob says, I often think about this topic. Sometimes I wonder if the lack of knowledge regarding civics was created on purpose. Hard to hold people by certain standards if you don't know the rules. Yeah, I think like in the state of Florida, K through 12, you get one semester of civics. You also get one semester of economics. And I think that's why people are so weak in those two areas. Most people do not understand the government that they are responsible for because they essentially created the government. Right. And it's a fight. So us as black people and I'm saying black as uh, just a, a, a common term, our biggest fight historically is people don't want to respect our citizenship. Right. People don't want to respect our citizenship. And we've had to fight very hard just to get people to respect our basic citizenship. And so I think that's the issue is that we have kind of been programmed that we just supposed to let this stuff go along. And so I don't want somebody coming to me and saying, well, the cop did it. This guy killed George Floyd because he was black. I don't care about that. My question is, he killed George Floyd and now that's going to cost me money because I can't prove the fact that he killed him because he was black. I can't prove it's going to cost me money. Right. I can't prove that. You know, the situation or uh, Ham Hawk said that the situation with Memphis and Tyree Nichols happened because of black mothers. I can't prove that. What I can prove is going to cost me money, though. If I'm a, if I'm a resident of the city of Memphis, that situation gonna cost me money. And it could cost me more money than the whole budget for the police department. So how do we justify this with numbers? And he knows because he's lost a lot of jobs because they couldn't justify keeping him on the job. That's why he's doing what he's doing now, because if he can't justify the blaze keeping him, they're going to get rid of his ass, too. So he understands budgets and things of that nature. But so he's telling the public something totally different because he's lost jobs 
because they couldn't justify paying him anymore because he wasn't bringing that kind of money into them. That's why he's worked all over the place. But he's not going to tell that part. He's going to talk. He's going to tell you a whole nother story because he don't want you to get that kind of understanding. Like I said, the media is lying to all of us and they all lying to us. Ain't not just some of them. So Will says, I didn't see a camera phone towels in the eighth grade. I feel you. So Mark Swift says, Massachusetts State Police has a scandal after scandal, stealing overtime and CDL for gifts. Y'all believe you. That's real. Police unions intimidate politicians and media. They do. They, they often do. And politicians go for it because the, the police unions are more proactive politically than most citizens. Right? So the police unions are very proactive politically. Most citizens are not. So that's why the police unions get what they want, because they're very proactive politically. The average American person has been kind of programmed that they're just supposed to work, pay taxes and consume. And anything outside of that, they think somebody else is supposed to handle it for them. So Ray Gunn says, isn't it their extrinsic, isn't their value extrinsic in that the officers give a sense of protection for businesses and the citizens who vote to keep the city council members and the mayor in power. That's what it's supposed to be. I mean, cities, police really are here to protect property. Property, but also property starts with your individual person. Um, but see, this, this is the thing, Ray Gunn. It can be situation by situation. So you in one part of the city, I'm in another part of the city. In the part of the city that I'm in, we may decide this is how we want our police to function. And as long as they're not breaking a state or federal law, we want them to function that way. On your side of the city, you may decide in your local area, we want our police to function this way. And as long as they're not breaking the state or federal law, then they have to function that way. Right. But most people, they're not even engaged enough. And I think they often can't even communicate what they really want from their government. They don't know what the police are supposed to be doing. So they just spend all their time trying to avoid arrest because I think they don't really know what the job. The job of law enforcement is to enforce the law, our laws, not their laws. We supposed to decide what the laws are. So that's why 20 years ago, you could get arrested for marijuana. Now, in some places you can't because they changed the law. Right. So I think it's, a, it's like I said, it's a lack of understanding on the role of government. So fresh, pro fresh progress. Well, and this, I think the black community. So let's 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 start with this. Miss progress. Well, you might be new to the platform. Let's define what we mean by black community, because there's 40 million black people inside the United States and we all live in different areas. So how do we define black community? Should have organized better post Trayvon Martin. What is the legacy? I think people I think individuals and in their local areas should have been organized way before Trayvon Martin. Right. But I don't like to use the term black community. I say black people. and I kind of explain what I mean. But black community to me is a media generated term and it's very ambiguous uh, based on what community actually means. So you may live in a different part of the country that I live in. We're not part of the same community. Why? Because we don't live together. Right. We may know each other. We may have a um, an acquaintance, but we're not part of the same community because why? We don't live around each other. I'm members of the community that I live with or another community that we have formed based around a particular goal or an objective that we have. Right. Uh, so this is something because I'm a student of Amos Wilson. This is my definition of community. But we're not in the same community just because we got the same skin color. I don't believe in that. Right. We could have some commonalities, but we're not in the same community because what do we agree on? That's what builds community. But no disrespect to you. I appreciate the question. SB says it's also the police union. Definitely. That's a faction. And the police union have a right to advocate for their best benefit. But at the end of the day, I'm paying for my taxes. So your desires as a union can't supersede the money that I'm using to supply everything. But this takes place because a lot of taxpayers don't realize even what they pay for. Most people don't even know what the budget is for their city. They don't know what the 10 year plan for their city is. All of this is public record, but they know that people are not going to read it. Therefore, when somebody says that Uvalde happened because people are talking about defunding the police. Well, I went and looked at Uvalde's budget. The Uvalde Police Department was getting 40% of the city budget. How much money do you need 
to go after a shooter. Do you need 10 more percent? So it was it was the money. The reason why y'all went after the dude, he shot at y'all. Y'all took fire and everybody fell back. But y'all got the numbers on the dude. It's one shooter and all of y'all. Everybody fell back and just they just held, took a holding position because y'all wasn't getting enough money. See, so this is the issue was that I'm not against I'm pro organized labor and people have a right to organize. They have a freedom of assembly and they have a right to organize around what they want. We talked about before building community. The problem is that when you're organizing against the public and your goals supersede what's best for the public is when we're going to start running into a problem. But they are able to scare people because like every labor union, what they do is they threaten a work stoppage. Right. That's why I believe police should be privatized. But the biggest opponents of privatization of police are unions because police unions do not want to organize against private businesses because they're hard to push over. It's easy to push over the public. It's hard to push over Microsoft. It's hard to push over Apple computers. It's hard to push over Tesla. You know, it's hard to push over Ford more. It's hard to push them over. You might come to a deal, but you ain't going to push them over. They can push over the public. They know it. They've been doing it for years. So they don't want to get out of an easy spot. It's easy to push over the public. It is a push over private business. It's hard to push them over. So that's why they don't want to get privatized. But this will solve all the problems. You privatize them because no private business is going to let an individual person be so detrimental to their business that they start costing them money. They're just going to fire them. And they're blacklisted where they can never work again. So what can be done to stop this negative behavior from the police? Withdrawal, withhold tax dollars. I would, and this is what I do, is I communicate to my local politicians that I'm concerned with the behavior of police when they do something wrong. But the most important thing, Miss Rashida, is I know exactly how much money in my area is going to police. I read the budget. So I'm aware of how much money and how much money from my tax dollars is going to support policing in my local area, right? And then though I communicate to my local politician that I'm concerned about these particular things and how we're not getting these things met from the police. But I know exactly how much money goes to police in my local area, right? And I don't live in the city of Atlanta. I live in Atlanta Metro, but I know how exactly how much we pay city police and I know exactly how much we pay county police. So I know what they're getting paid. I know how many people are on the force. I know if their budget is getting expanded a whole nine yards. Right. And it's their job. Th they're part of government and it's their job to make my life easier. It's not their job to make my life harder. So what the police were doing out in Ferguson was improper. Because they were making the lives of people in Ferguson harder. Their job was to make the lives of people in Ferguson easier. But the people of Ferguson don't know that. So I don't, I just operate differently. But like I said, I spend a lot of time reading and understanding what, what is on the docket and what the documentation says. And I try not to get caught up in the story that's been created by the media. So Miss Katrina says, we still don't have an organized definitely where's the Black Lives Matter organization. Miss Katrina, I think they took the money and just went on about their life. I haven't seen nary uh, ad for primaries going on right now. I think primary ads getting ready to start getting picked up. Yeah, I think I think BLM took the money and just fell back. I think, but the issue that I that I try to tell people, and that's how I say how apathetic people are, is everything that BLM was talking about they were going to do to deal with um, extrajudicial killings by police. There were organizations in every city that was already doing that. It's just people weren't interested until the media told them about BLM, right? BLM was essentially was promoted by the media. Then, like I said, you get point and counterpoint. People for BLM, people against it. That's how they get their little attention, right? That's just how this game works. That's how the media really works. People really did the research. Some of the biggest people in media that they think are against each other are being represented by the same agencies. People don't even understand this. These people don't have no problem with each other. They're being represented by the same agencies. It can't be a problem. So GC says you got to let people know that you're serious because politicians and people yap all the time. You got to stand on it repetitively. Definitely. You're 100 percent correct, GC. And you got to let them people know that you organize and you got to let them people know that you'll put money behind what you say you want. Because politicians are only interested, in my opinion, with maintaining their job as a politician. They don't care about nothing else. So whatever is going to keep them in a position, that's who they're going to go with. And people got to just accept that. 
Politicians are prostitutes. Prostitutes go whoever got the money. That's why I don't put no I don't put a politician on no pedestal. Just like I don't put no prostitute on no pedestal. You know? And I don't want to, you know, put no game out here, but yeah, we don't, I don't do that. So that's what people, but people want to feel like I'm backing this politician because they're my guy or my girl or whatever. They prostitute. So they're gonna go who got the money. Prostitutes have sex with whoever pays them. If you just got to meet their number, that's what it is. So Miss Katrina says, we in primaries right now in Texas. I feel you. So Mr. Merriweather, um, I don't have any, that's not the topic of the show, but if you come back on a later show, maybe we can discuss that, but that's not the topic of the show, man. I want to say peace to you and stay, stay blessed. So Alexander Wilson, Derek Sherman's wife got convicted for tax fraud. I feel you. Again, how does he, how does he afford a house? in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota on a tax on a cop salary. And I know, no, I'm sorry. How does he afford a house in Windermere, Florida, which is west of Orlando? I know how much those houses cost on a uh, cop salary, which is interesting, but it is what it is. So appreciate everybody for coming through. Uh, stay safe. Talk to y'all later, man. Have a, have a safe weekend and be easy.